You're listening to the Bethel Community Church Podcast. Our podcast normally showcases our weekly sermons here in Chicago at 7601 West Foster. Now, podcasts are great, but they do not replace the care and community you receive from the local church or from your local pastor. So we encourage you to come join our community or contact us to help you find a community in your area. We pray the Lord speaks to you as you listen. Enjoy. Everybody else, we're going to be continuing in the gospel according to Mark. Look at Mark 2, verse 13 through chapter 3, verse 6. And so I would invite you to turn there if you're using the Bible as provided in the pew. That's on page 837. Let's go to Lord in prayer as we come this morning. Father, we, we thank you as we just sang, you, our God, have saved our souls. You have given us hope, given us true life, abundant life, as Jesus says. You have made us yours. That is where our security, that is where our assurance is to be found in you and in being yours. Father, we pray for those within our body who this morning are going through hardships of various kinds and Certainly our prayer is that you would remind them of your unceasing care for them, that you are their good shepherd, and so you will lead them into lush valleys. You will provide for them and protect them. And so, Lord, we this morning ask for Marvella Sorensen and continued healing for her and that she would be able to be back with us soon. Pray for Gerhard and Lydia Kaiser and continue to pray that you would restore Gerhard and they would be able to be back with us soon as well as they want to be. Pray for Will Longenecker who can't be with us due to vertigo this morning and ask that you would strengthen him. Pray for the family of Judy Worsham that you would bless them with comfort and for any who don't know you in Lord, that her testimony would be pointing them to you and that you would indeed save them as well. Father, we pray for Eddie as he now finds out that the cancer has returned and pray that you would continue to give doctors wisdom and restore him. God, there are others who are hurting among us, perhaps not with physical Uh, Pain, but going through emotional difficulty, spiritual struggles. Father, we pray that you would meet them where they are this morning and remind them of your care. Father, we pray as it is Sanctity of Life Sunday that you would help us to be a people who are truly about life to the fullest. In our own lives, but also, Lord, seeking it for others. For the unborn, and Lord, for those who care for them. Lord, we ask that as Gladdy prayed, that you would bring an end to abortion. Not just that it would be something that people can't do, it would be something that would be unthinkable to them. Father, we pray that you would help us to join in your great cause for life and flourishing. And Father, we ask as we come to look at your word, prepare us. To hear from you. Father, I pray as I preach your word that as I stand behind this sacred desk, I would do so not as one speaking my own thoughts or words, but one who is preaching the very oracles of God. Pray, Lord, that we would receive it and walk in light of what you say. Our trust is in you. Work by your spirit to accomplish your purpose. In the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. When a man and a woman get married, you're not just taking and stitching two separate lives and ways of living together. If you do that, you'll find that that marriage will be full of tension. You'll find that that marriage will not have much success because the two are becoming one flesh. 
And so there needs to be a whole new way of living. Yes, conflict will be inevitable because you're bringing two people together. But as a husband and wife work through it, you can have a long-lasting, joyful marriage. When Angela and I got married, I used to just let the milk in my cup sit there and, and just sort of get crusty. And, and you know, I remember that you know, as a single man, if you put water in it and all that you get are those little floaties coming up, it's just time to get a new cup. You put it in the sink and you get out another one. Well, thankfully, I've learned, though I'm still improving, to rinse the cup out completely. And as you do so, you can use it again. You can ask her about it later. You need to learn a new way of living if you're going to truly live together with someone. Well, Jesus, the bridegroom, has come. As we see in Mark 2, his kingdom cannot just be sown on Judaism. His work can't just be somehow put into the leather uh, wineskins of Judaism at all. Jesus came to establish a new way, and as he goes on to say later, he establishes a new covenant in his blood. Well, the coming of Jesus brought controversies, brought conflicts with the Jewish leaders because the old and the new ways were incompatible. So our main idea Today, as we are going to be walking through this passage, Mark 2, verse 13 through 3, verse 6, is that since Jesus has established his new way, let us as his people follow him, call and welcome repentant sinners, serve the cause of life and flourishing together. Now, before we jump into verse 13, a little bit of context for you. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 that we looked at last week, we saw that Jesus is, has authority to forgive sins. And so that is the context of these following verses in verses 13 to 17. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 was really a transitional passage showing Jesus' authority over to forgive sins, but also then it is the first of a series of five controversies that he has with the religious leaders. So let's look at verses 13 through 17 and see really what's the second controversy that Jesus has with the Pharisees. We also see, as I mentioned, it's based upon his authority to forgive sins. Verse 13, Mark writes, he went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So we begin here seeing that Jesus calls and welcomes sinners. In fact, if you were to look at Matthew 11, verse 19, people actually called Jesus a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And here we see why. He's eating with them. He's identifying with them. As Jesus, as we read here, is teaching by the Sea of Galilee... 
He comes across Levi, who's a, a tax collector, or probably better, a toll collector. If you're old enough to remember, there was a time when you didn't have eye passes in your car. You had to stop on the expressway to pay your toll. Well, that was probably similar to what Matthew, or excuse me, Levi's doing. He's, we're told in the gospel, according to Matthew, his other name is Matthew. When Jesus calls him, just as with Simon and Andrew and James and John, they left their boats and followed Jesus, so Levi, when Jesus calls him, drops everything and follows him. Now, as a toll collector, Levi probably had a rather lucrative job. He was probably sitting at a toll booth, well, similar to a toll booth, perhaps a, somewhat of a table, at the Via Maris, which is the trade route from Damascus to Caesarea, and it ran right through Capernaum. Well, for Levi, there's no going back. The moment he leaves, he's going to be replaced. Now, for Levi, this indeed was a change of life. But for Jesus, this was a scandal. And it's one thing to call fishermen, at least that was a respectable trait. But he's calling a toll collector. And though Levi probably didn't work directly for Rome, he's probably working for Herod Antipas, he's still working for the enemy. Commentators say that tax collectors would be excommunicated from the synagogue, couldn't serve as a judge or a witness in a court case, and were viewed by their family as a disgrace. More than that, they were seen as thieves because they often overcharged people, which you can read about later in Luke 19 with Zacchaeus. Not only did Jesus have one toll collector following him, notice verse 15, he had many tax collectors and sinners following him. And he's reclining at table. He's eating with them, identifying with them. And so he's doing what good religious people of that day didn't do. And that's why the Pharisees come and they ask him, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Mark uses that phrase three times here to drive home that point. Jesus is willing to be with them and among them. Notice Jesus' reply. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He didn't come to call the righteous. He came to call sinners. And so just as a doctor has to be among sick people to treat sick people, so if Jesus is a savior of sinners, if he's come to save us from the wrath of God and our sin, then of course he has to be among us. As the Son of God with authority to forgive sins, that's exactly why Jesus came. To call sinners to repentance. This is why Jesus truly is the friend of sinners. In John chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, Jesus says before he goes to the cross, greater love has no one than this. Then someone lay down his life for his friends. He says, you are my friends if you do as I command you. Think of the wonder of that, that Jesus, the sinless, pure, perfect son of God is a friend of sinners like you and me. And we couldn't ask for a better friend than Jesus. One who knows us and loves us no matter how big of a mess we get ourselves into. He's come to welcome sinners with the welcome of God. In verse 15, for the first time, Mark uses an important word. The word is disciple. The word disciple literally means an apprentice or, or a learner. Now, Jesus 
He isn't just calling us to learn from him. He's not just calling us to learn about him. As disciples, we are to learn Christ himself so that we imitate him. More than that, because the spirit of Christ is at work in us, Christ lives through us to accomplish his purpose. And so as as a church, there, there are two ways, two really applications I see for us. One is this. We are to be like Jesus on mission. What that means is we need to be out among sinners. We need to be building relationships with people who don't yet know the Lord. Now, we do need to be careful, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Bad company ruins good morals. You know, we don't see Jesus, you know, as he's hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. He's not, you know, doing sinful things like they do. So we need to be careful. But we need to make sure that we're not worried about our reputation or what people might think if we're hanging out with people who are living in sin. And if you have received the welcome of Jesus Christ into the family of God, Church, this is the second application for us. We are to welcome others too. The same way that we've been welcomed. Not because we're such good people or we've done such good things. No, we were welcomed by the grace of God through faith in Christ alone. And so we are to welcome others in the same way. Paul says in Romans 15, 7, Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. I thank God we are a welcoming church, as as Glad he mentioned earlier. If you weren't greeted by at least two people, I don't know which door you came in. We want to be a welcoming church. That's reason to celebrate God's work among us. You know, we shouldn't be breaking off our arm trying to pat ourselves on the back. No. We should be celebrating. This is God's work in us, welcoming us, but we need to be careful. We need to remain vigilant because it's so easy to fall back into the way of thinking of the Pharisees here. The danger is that we can begin to judge other people who who aren't like us. Maybe they dress differently. Maybe they've got more tattoos or piercings than we do. Maybe they have a different skin color than we do or, or a different education or economic status. Or maybe they've committed a sin in their lives. We could never imagine ourselves committing. See, the pharisaical, legalistic attitude in which we judge others at its core has a high view of self. We think very much of ourselves, but it has a very low view of the standard of God and of God's grace. We need to remind ourselves we are sinners who have been welcomed by God by his grace. It's God who's made us new. And so we're to welcome others by that same grace in Christ. This is the new way of Jesus. Which brings us into verses 18 to 22. Read now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he dodges the patch, tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. 
But new wine is for fresh wineskins. Here we see that Jesus has come to establish the way of joy. We live in a very divided nation in these days. You know, often we make it a we we talk about the division between conservatives and progressives. Of course, it's a presidential election year. All 366 days of this year, since it's a leap year, it's a presidential election year. And so that those divisions are at fever pitch. Well, Jesus in one sense, is neither a conservative or a progressive. In another sense, Jesus is both a conservative and a progressive, not in a political sense. But as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, he hasn't come to abolish the law. He's come to fulfill. He's a conservative in that way. And yet... He's a progressive in that he hasn't come to merely sew a patch onto the garment of Judaism. He hasn't come to put his new wine into their old brittle leather wineskins. He's come to bring in a new covenant. As you read in Hebrews 8 verse 13. The writer of Hebrews writes, In speaking of the new covenant, he that is God makes the first one obsolete. And what's becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. See, there's no going back for us to the old covenant. We're new covenant believers in Christ. That doesn't mean that we do away with the Old Testament. Rather, it's our scriptures and we're to read it in light of Jesus Christ. The Pharisees were very conservative. They believed in reforming Judaism, and if they did, that there would be a revival. Likewise, John was calling people to repent, to turn back to God, and so these two groups, being zealous, came together, and they were known for fasting regularly. A little bit of Old Testament background for you. The Old Testament, in in the first five books, people were only told to fast one day. The Day of Atonement. We come to after the exile, when the people have returned to the land. Zechariah 7 and 8, you can record, you can read, Zechariah records that they were fasting four times a year then. We get to the the first century, and, and the Pharisees are fasting exponentially more than they used to. The Pharisees were known for fasting two times a week, Monday and Thursday. And so they're coming and they see Jesus' disciples. They're not fasting. And so in their religious zeal, they're thinking something in Jesus' teaching is deficient. So they ask him about it. Now, beyond fasting, I need to be clear, we can easily end up being much like the Pharisees in our attitudes. You see, it's very easy to, in our religious zeal, even in something that we have liberty in, we can easily begin to think everybody needs to do exactly like I do, and if they don't, then it must be because their religion is deficient. I'm a better Christian than they are. Why? Because well, I wake up every morning at 5 to read the Bible, or 6, or 7, or whatever time. If somebody's not reading their Bible in the morning, they must not be as good of a Christian as I am. And so we take something that actually is good, but we think that everybody else has to do it. Notice how Jesus responds here, verse 19. He says, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom's with them? Of course, the answer is no. You, if you ever go to a wedding, don't fast there. Fasting is a sign of, of mourning, of grieving that things in life aren't as they're meant to be. Whereas a wedding is a celebration, it's a joyful time that life is as it's meant to be in that way. Well, Jesus, the bridegroom, is present with his new wine. It's a time of joy, a time of celebration. And even more than that, there's an Old Testament background to this. God is the husband of his people. 
And so for Jesus to be the groom of his people can only show us that Jesus is claiming equality with God. Thankfully, one day, Revelation 19, Jesus is going to return. The groom's going to return for his bride. We're going to celebrate with him forever. There will be no more fasting. But, what is verse 20? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them. And those words are talking about violently being taken away in the cross. Jesus would rise from the dead and ascend back to the Father. And so with this time between the times before Jesus returns, as Christians, we've got to ask, well, is fasting appropriate for us? The answer is yes, but it's not commanded. Even in Matthew 6, Jesus doesn't command us to fast. No, it's a matter of liberty for Christians. As Christians, our natural posture is to actually be one of joy. Why? Because Christ, even though he's returned to the Father, he hasn't left us as orphans. He's given us his spirit. And so we are to be a people marked by joy predominantly. You know, nobody should call us horse Christians because we walk around with such long faces. There are times to mourn during this age. Yes, there are Christians who will struggle with depression and despair. But as a people, we ought to be marked by the joy of the Lord. Because Christ, our bridegroom, has come. And he's given us his spirit. That doesn't mean we're to be frivolous. We are to have true joy because of God. So this is the way of Jesus. The next two controversies that Jesus addresses are regarding one of the main distinguishing marks of the old covenant people of God, the Sabbath. You see in verses 23 through 28, the one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him? And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. What is Jesus rules over Sabbath rest? This is actually a huge claim by Jesus. To claim to be Lord of the Sabbath, again, is to claim equality with God, the one who gave the command for the Sabbath. This all took place when Jesus and his disciples, they're walking through the grain fields, and it's possible there's some Pharisees with them. It's possible that... Rather, the Pharisees just hear about it and later talk with Jesus. But there's no actual problem with them plucking heads of grain and eating them. According to Deuteronomy 23, verse 25, if you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Rather, the conflict is simply that they're doing this on the Sabbath day and the Pharisees had 39 rules, 39 ways of working that you weren't supposed to do on the Sabbath. These included sowing, plowing, reaping, binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, cleansing crops, grinding, sifting, kneading, baking, shearing wool, washing or beating or dyeing it, spinning, weaving, making two loops, weaving two threads, separating two threads, tying, loosening, sewing two stitches, tearing in order to sew two stitches, hunting a gazelle, slaughtering or flaying or salting it or curing its skin, scraping it or cutting it up, writing two letters, erasing in order to write two letters, building, pulling down, putting out a fire. (laughs) What do you do if there's a fire on the Sabbath? Lighting a fire, striking with a hammer, and taking anything from one domain into another. 
If you go over to Israel, or if you've ever been there, you know that on the Sabbath, everything stands still. From sundown Friday to sundown on Saturday, everything just stops. They get together, they eat with family, and they celebrate. When I was over there, we actually took a boat out onto the Sea of Galilee with the only Christian tour guide. And so we were the only ones out on the Sea of Galilee that Friday night. It was a pretty neat uh, experience. When we got back to the hotel, they had three different elevators, and the middle elevator was the Shabbat elevator, the Sabbath elevator. That elevator ran by itself, and it would go up and stop at every floor, and it would come back down, stopping at every floor because they considered it work to press the button in the elevator. You know, it's remarkable to me here with Jesus that Jesus doesn't even talk with them about whether or not what the disciples are doing should even be considered work. Neither does he say, oh, you know, that part of the Bible is unimportant. No, Jesus recognizes the absolute authority of Scripture. And that's why he appeals to a different passage, 1 Samuel 21 and 22. Back then they didn't have chapter and verse, and so you would appeal to a specific passage. And that's probably why Jesus talks about Abiathar being the high priest, because it was actually Abiathar's father, Ahimelech, that that uh, David came to and gave David and his men the bread. But Jesus is appealing just to that portion of Scripture. What's most important, though, what Jesus is saying is that David ate the bread of the presence with his men. So what's Jesus saying then? Is Jesus saying, well, if David could break the law, I can break the law too. No, that's not quite what Jesus is saying. Rather, Jesus is saying, as David's greater son, I am Lord of the Sabbath. It is mine, my authority to determine what is lawful on the Sabbath and not, because I am Lord of the Sabbath. And as he says, the Sabbath wasn't given for us to be a burden. You know, you read Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, and God makes man before he gives them the Sabbath. You know, God didn't create people because the Sabbath needed people to rest. No, God gave the Sabbath because his people needed rest. It was a gift. And so as Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus is telling them only he can give the true rest of God. Because only Jesus can reconcile you to God. Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 11 says, So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. How can you enter? The Sabbath rest of God. The true rest that God only can give. Well, it's not by anything that you can do. It's not by anything you don't do. It's all through faith in Jesus. It's receiving it as a gift from God. His grace, because Christ is the one who's paid for it in his blood. You bow the knee to the Lord of the Sabbath. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart to him. Don't disobey. Instead, strive to enter into that rest through faith in Jesus alone. Well, as the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus came to restore the purpose of the Sabbath. As we see in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Again, he entered the synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand and They watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. 
And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. As Jesus restores life and flourishing here. He's again in the synagogue at Capernaum, and this man with the paralyzed hand is there. Jesus calls him up, and the reason he does so is because Jesus is going to deal with the heart of the issue, which is the Pharisees' hardness of heart. So Jesus asks, is it lawful to do good or to do harm, to do evil on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to save a life, or is it lawful to kill And the Pharisees are silent. And the reason that they're silent is because they know if they answer Jesus, what they say will incriminate themselves. Because as we see in verse 6, as soon as he's healed the man, immediately on the Sabbath, they go out and they're plotting to kill Jesus, to do harm, to do evil. So Jesus is filled with right indignation. He's he's grieved because of their hardness of heart. But he does what's right anyways. He heals this man. And think of the irony of this for a moment. They saw Jesus just with a word supernaturally heal someone. They get to witness what he's doing, and yet because their hearts are so hard, they reject it. If this is work, speaking a word, and just about anything else is work, why is it that anyone would reject the way of Jesus? Why would anyone reject Jesus' way of grace and of life and and of joy and of flourishing? The only reason that people would reject Jesus' way is because they want their way more. If you're rejecting Jesus, it's because you love your way. But today, Jesus offers you another way, a way of true life and flourishing. In himself. How are you responding to Jesus? You know, we await the eternal rest that Jesus will give when he returns. But even now, we can be a people who live in the rest of Jesus. You see, rest isn't meant to be something that's a burden. It's meant to be a joy. It's meant to be life-restoring. Are you receiving God's gift of rest? As a gift, are you relying on God and living in faith? I mean, I've got to admit, it can be hard. Life's been busy recently. There's always more things to do. Am I willing to trust God with them? Am I willing even in everyday life to accept that gift of rest? Or am I instead always going? Let me be clear Rest isn't meant to be some sort of legalistic requirement. It's a gift. And we are stewards of everything in our lives, including the time that God gives to us. Let me be clear. Rest is not laziness. There's a huge distinction. Rest is something that you're receiving as a gift from God. Laziness is really a form of theft sin because you're taking what God hasn't given you. Yet, how are we using the rest that God gives us? You know, again, I I can speak for myself. It's easy when I have a time of rest to just say, okay, I want to do what I want to do. I want to sit there. I want to read a book or I want to sit there and watch some sports on TV or a movie or, or I want to you know, spend time playing a game that I want to play. And so rest then becomes all about me, me, me. But God didn't give us rest 
to fill ourselves. As Jesus says, to do good, to save life. As God's people on this Sanctity of Life Sunday, we are to be a people about life, about true flourishing, about restoring life and flourishing to others. You know, we're in a nation that kills 2,500 babies through abortion a day. As God's people, we can get involved perhaps in personal ways, perhaps as a church, we ought to be involved supporting. We ought to be involved actively helping others and promoting life. We're also to be those who on the other side of abortion, likewise promoting life and flourishing by speaking the life-giving message of Christ. That there is forgiveness, that there is hope, that there is new life, even for those who sin. Why? Because that's our only hope as well. As God's people, Jesus has proven himself to be to us a friend of sinners, a physician of souls, proven himself to be the true bridegroom, proven himself to be the Lord of rest. Let us be those who live Jesus' way and take this good news to those around us. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the friend of sinners. Thank you for the one who alone gives us rest. Father, I pray if there are any here who haven't received that gift of forgiveness and rest that is found only in Jesus, that today would open their eyes to their need of the Savior. They would open their, that you would open their eyes to see that Jesus is the friend who they need. Father, as we go from this place, we pray that we would go living in the new way of Jesus, a way that's always new and fresh because Christ is with us. Thank you for your word, Lord. We trust the work to inscribe it on our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.